welcome to the Aston Barkley Podcast. My name is Ben Crawford, and you join me today in a very sunny Wakefield, just after we've hosted the BVRLA Residual Value and Remarketing Forum. I'm joined here today by Jeff Grindle, Head of Asset Valuation and Pricing at Arval BNP Paribus Group and RVR Committee Chairman, and Martin Potter, Chief Customer Officer of Aston Barkley. Welcome, gents. Good Thank afternoon. You, um, today's the first time the BVRLA Residual Value and Remarketing Forum has come back together physically. So we've had over 60 people from right across the industry descend on Aston Barclay Wakefield. Jeff, what was it like to get people back together physically? Yeah, so firstly, thank you for hosting us. It was great to actually get people out and about again. So two and a half years since we've asked been out and about and seeing people. Um, and there is nothing better than actually getting in a room, sharing views, getting the feedback and feeling that energy and buzz from all of the delegates who, who have made the effort to come up here. Um, so some people have travelled as far as Southampton, um, some have come as far as Western Supermare, and even from the other side from the north. So actually coming together, it's been a great experience for all, I think. Yeah, Mark, and it speaks to our experience of physical anyway, doesn't it? You know, we know that our buyers and vendors actually, you know, demand physical, so it's good to see there's a, a, a synergy there. Yeah, it was really nice. I think the last time we hosted was back in November 19, I think we said, when the site um, had only been open about eight months. So, yeah, it's really good to um, see people in the flesh, and, and I think, um, Jeff will confirm, you got a much better reaction, lots more questions than I think you get if we had the meeting on Teams, uh, interactions much better, uh, and hopefully then all the delegates get a lot more out of the day, don't they? So, um, yeah, real real good to see people back in the flesh and, and actually really enjoying the uh, information provided to them and um, an opportunity for everybody in the breaks and stuff to sort of chat about the challenges that everyone's facing and how they're dealing with them. So, yeah, really good day. And I suppose that is, you know, how things have shifted and the online very much has its place and there is a real, you know, there is a place for that online meeting, but... There are some instances where you just can't replicate that online experience or the physical experience, sorry. And it's the, the bits in between the presentations that you just can't replicate. Absolutely. There are some people there today who said they haven't been in a conference online because they don't see the value of it. There are people who are here for the first time um, who are new to the industry set up with what they do. And they're saying when they actually see and understand and can ask the questions and see the reaction of others and go and have a conversation at lunch time and just say, Okay, so what is your views of this and how do we look at the different subjects which are available? Um, it's just been great for all, I think. And what were, your, what were the highlights from today's presentations that you took away? Yeah, so today's presentations, we're fortunate to have um, lots of data Im information provided. So we ha had Martin giving an, an overview of the view from the rostrum. We had uh, Dylan from CAP giving an overview. We had Ed from... Auto trader. So there was a lot of data from that side, which was then supported by um, the policy mandates of what were going on from the different policy views. But within the data, it's everyone having an opinion of what's there. So there's these companies are sharing their information of what they are seeing, and as delegates, we can take it away and say which bits we find useful and which are relevant to us. Um, it was very clear from the feedback, and as Martin just mentioned, that there's a great value to actually seeing a vehicle when people are buying it. Mm -hmm. The numbers re reflected that was the, the people who are buying in physical are taking four vehicles away as opposed to an online taking two vehicles away mm -hmm. because they're seeing the reactions of what's going on from those uh, other elements. That's not to say online doesn't have its place. It absolutely does. The people who had turned up today who hadn't been around for two years, they said, well, I haven't been, even been in the industry for some of it. And the industry have moved a long, long way in two years and people have had to invest in different ways to be able to adapt to the different markets. But the core principles are the same. It's a piece of metal which needs to be shifted. and It's a different way of how people want to actually shift that metal and actually buy that metal on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had all these, you know, you, like you say, we had the companies presenting each with a different view and there were lots of overlaps between those views weren't there you know it's nice to see that there's consistency right across the industry in experience yeah that, that's it so the people who are presenting all have a lot of knowledge they pulled a lot of time together to pull the, their views um and you can look at the same set of data and look at it a different way um because it depends on what that audience and what that individual wants to take away from it there's not a one size fits, fits all this isn't a textbook and follow a process and everyone does it the same way it's a massive organization with lots of variables available so having those people share their experience and expertise 
to help others. At the end of the day, we're all in the business to help people survive and grow our organizations. And the only way that does is following a works is following industry people giving their information and input to how people people form their own opinions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, data plays a really big part in that, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the dynamic of the BVRLA really helps as well because there's lots of different challenges for different elements of that. So, you know, the rental market's got different challenges to maybe what the le- the leasing market might have. You had OEMs in the room, you've got retailers uh, and and understanding that market. So I actually think it's a great uh, diverse group of people with very different challenges, but actually coming together helps them all to maybe a see the big picture overall, but also then, as Jeff said, apply some of those uh, elements of data and anecdotal feedback from questioning into their own world uh, and, and share that over coffee and lunch as well, which I think is really important because there's actually quite a lot of different uh, industries amongst the one automotive <laughs> industry, isn't there? Which Absolutely. Is unique. Yeah, and, then, and that's it, as you say. If you've got one of the OEMs there who's listening to information, well, they're listening to, well, what's the impact on the stock supply? Because their impact on what's going on in the youth market, well, they're thinking, well, if I can get more stock in, we can take advantage of what's going on on that side of it. There's there's clearly a demand pressure, even with everything else going on. There's lots of demand pressure out there. We've seen the lead times on vehicles. Whereas a daily rental, they're sat there thinking, well, I can't get hold of a vehicle at the moment. Mm-hmm. So they're having to go into the used car market to get their vehicles. So how do they take it away? The leasing companies are the hybrid in between of what's going on. Um, there were car valenting companies of uh, understanding what's going on with the marketplace. So, yeah, it's 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 an opportunity for lots of people to just, t- just take a look at what's happening and then take their views of what they're going to do and how they're going to apply it to their own businesses. But it won't be the same for everyone. So it'll be interesting when we get the feedback, what were the key takeaways for the delegates here today? Mm-hmm. One one area that was, was clear in mind, every time we host a podcast together, it's something that comes up time and again, and it's that the retail demand versus you know the lack of wholesale supply and the impact that that's invariably having on price. What's your experience of that, Jeff? Yeah, so I think when you look at the supply position, OEMs, have changed their business models because they need to change their business models, what they're doing, how they look at their profitability changes. So what that then does into the middle position of what those people in the in the middle are doing, then they're, they're going to have, those people in the middle, again, are going to have to adapt what they're doing. So people are having to accept that if you want a new vehicle, you're going to be waiting up to two years these days. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you want to go, go down a different route, there is an option within the used car market from that side of it. When you then look into the retail, of the, if we look at it from a buyer point of view, it is all about what is a premium someone prepared to pay for having a vehicle now? Because you might not get the vehicle from supplier A, you could go to supplier B. But there's still vehicles out there. It's just what what your desires are, and that's where people's characteristics are going to change. Yeah. And it's, we, I mean, we mentioned it before, but we've seen what were prior vendors, you know, the higher companies that would, you know, invariably give us their stock they now become buyers because they're struggling so much to you know to get that new product. Yeah, that's it. Because uh, if you go back historically, OEMs would use the rental companies to shift metal quickly at a cheaper margin because it all parts as a flow chain. Where can they make the most money? Where does it flow down? The rental company was there the option to get rid of metal quickly. Well, no, they haven't got the metal to get rid of quickly. So those rental companies are sat there and thinking, well, where am I going to get my vehicle from? They have no alternative but then to say, well, their average age of their fleet is going to get older, so are they going to have to go and look at the used market to, to, to fulfil that need? Mm-hmm. You've seen the prices of the rental, the, the short-term rental prices, if you want to go and lease a vehicle for your holiday for five or seven days, that's doubled. That's not necessarily because a rental company profiteering, it's because the dynamics where you've had to change in their business model, the cost them for to, to the cost of them being able to prepare that is having a major impact. Yeah, the metal is more expensive to yeah. them. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we, we spoke a little bit about the, so the impact that has on the price. Obviously, it puts that up quite significantly, be it you know, the new or, the, or in fact the used. Compare that then or put that alongside the rising cost of living crisis that we currently face. It creates quite a paradigm, doesn't it, in that, in that you know, the consumer market, the retail market. Absolutely. I think one of the key messages I heard today was the cost of living crisis is linked to wealth. Okay, So if we, if we see companies going out there and offering a 3% pay rise for their employees, 
for someone on a 20 grand pay salary that impact of a 3% still means they're under pressure. So they're still not going to be able, with an extra £600, to go and buy a new car accordingly. They're going to be using that on their electric. But a 3% pay rise to someone on 70 grand makes a significant difference sort of thing. So they are carrying on being able to buy their vehicles um, and go out there and, in a way, carry on with their life of what they're doing from that side of it. So there is definitely a wealth link back to the cost of living which is going on not to say it's not hurting those with more money it is but the percentages and the real impact in pounds and amounts on those individuals is definitely hitting those at the lower end of um, their income streams I don't know what you think yeah and I think that unfortunately that's always the case the low income earners seem to have the biggest impact all the time that the inflation affects them a great deal more Um, so yeah it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because it's always the people that are on those lower incomes that suffer more. Um, and it was interesting today, some of those statistics whereby actually the inflation um, hasn't had as much effect as I realised on use, uh, used car sales. Now that might mean that you know some of those sales, so that's more about transactions, not necessarily people going out and buying a more expensive car. Might be that they're actually downsizing or releasing equity and st- still having a transaction. Um, yeah, I found that quite interesting. That inflation from a used car perspective didn't have too much of an effect in terms of people transacting. But I think again, like we've touched on. Data can tell you lots of things, and mm-hmm. the devil was in the detail. So whilst there's transactions going on, I do believe that people um, will be looking to uh, assist their own uh, net disposable income by either releasing some equity in a car, because thankfully uh, vehicle values have gone up quite a lot in the last 18 months. So in the past, that wouldn't have been something you could have done, um, which will hopefully still result in more transactions, which will help the, the dealership still to... Uh, improve their sales ratios which so even out of these difficult times there's always something there for those businesses to t- take hold of yeah and i think there's a, a crucial piece there around if you think of someone who's already got a car today and want to release the equity well they're still going to need a car mm-hmm. so you're thinking the part exchange rate may increase because they're releasing some equity and that equity they can then get to put into a higher purchase agreement or PCP on a new used vehicle position. So it's not as if you can release the equity and not need a car in many cases, because if you look at rail costs and all that, that's all increasing at the same time. Mm -hmm. But there is that opportunity with the strength of when they took out their, um, if they took a vehicle out on PCP in the past, they have got significant equity from when they took it out in 2018 and 2019. So there is that opportunity which probably is what's protecting that element of what's going on. I would say in the new vehicle market space, when you look at the, um, the demand and the behaviours of what we see around PCH versus BCH, you definitely see a slowing up of PCH inquiries and um, people considering taking and investing that cash because there's not the discounts there were back in 2016, 2017 on vehicles. Mm-hmm. So the cost of leasing a vehicle, even on a nice vehicle, would be going up 100, 200 pounds sort of thing, even if the projections of people's RVs have gone up. The cost of buying that metal is increasing because you've got a different landscape. Yeah, because the supply is so high relative yeah. to a lot of demand. Correct. Sorry, other way around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be nice to be back, have a little bit of supply again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that came up today um, in a large part of today's session was um, BEV. Uh, clearly, we're on a one-way path with regards to BAV. You know, in Aston Barclay, we're seeing that increase. You know, all the time in terms of the number of units that flow through our auction house. Um, when it comes to the, the new car registrations of that BEV product, how is the fleet and lease sector adapting to that? What, what, how are they having to change their business models to to adjust to this very expensive product? Yeah. So, if you look at it, what's going on for the leasing companies? I think a majority of leasing companies will have strategies of when they want to get to road zero as well from different things and different companies will approach it in different ways. One thing that's clear is we have very little experience of how the BEV market is going to be reacting in the used marketplace. So if you think today, BEV is only making up less than 1% of our sales which are going through, okay? Whereas the vehicle which are being put onto fleet are 15% plus, dependent on different companies. Okay, so that's going to flow through in the next two to three years or four years position. But people's behaviours around the vehicles they are taking will also change. So 
if you had someone who went for a premium badge vehicle in the past, because of the te- way the technology is working today, they might go to what would be a traditional mainstream OEM because there is an opportunity and you still get good kit. I use an example of 3D TVs. If you go back in the day, the best 3D t- the 3D TV had the best 2D te- technology on it. So if you want a good TV, you just well have a 3D TV because it was going to be by default have the best 2D. Mm-hmm. So if you then think of what's going on with the the BEVs, the best technology is going into BEVs. So it's not going into build a nice car vehicle, ice first, and then turn it into a BEV as it was five, six years ago on the first generations. It's let's build a BEV first, and if we want to put an additional fuel train on it to support demand and different things, look at it that way around. So it's a different behavior of what the supplier is. So the thought process is of how leasing companies are looking at these things is vastly different to the past. So you're back into a world of relying more on an expert opinion and people can have a a different view to different things because in reality we're not no one's going to have the magic wand to say they've got it 100 percent right for everything because the landscape is going to change so much yeah i agree it's it's a it's a massive part of the market and it's coming at us quite quickly uh with obviously the the regulations and no longer having any ice sales at all after sort of 20, 30, 35, etc. So it's it's a big change. And like uh, Jeff said, some some leasing company numbers are as high as new registrations over the last 18 months, being 67, 70% of all new registrations being battery electric. And I think those are probably the high end where those companies have made a decision to get to that sort of net zero emission situation real quick. Um and I think appetite is actually really high from uh, consumers and business users. I think a lot of there is an appetite to try and do the best we can and get into uh, vehicles that are polluting the country less. Um, however, there's always a trade-off of, of cost in order to do that because they are still very expensive. Mm-hmm. As we showed today, uh, BEVs alone have sort of tipped over the £30,000 mark for a 22-month-old battery electric vehicle. Obviously, the new cost of them is very expensive, but uh, as we discussed today, there are a lot more of those becoming available for manufacturers. The choice is widening. Hopefully, that creates competition and the price will start to come down to meet uh, the type of levels that uh, normal people can afford. But I I do still think there's a stepping stone as well going on. You know, the business users are often the first adopters of these things. So, uh, like we said today, Hybrid vehicles have been around for quite some time. The average age mileage profile is very similar to any normal ICE fleet vehicle. But consumers, um, because of that desire to get into a a better vehicle from an environmental perspective, those hybrids are now at a level of average wholesale price of sort of 18,000. Almost they're becoming affordable. So consumers, if they can't quite get into the battery electric they're stepping into the hybrid and just like business users did, they started with hybrid and then over the next period of time, then all of a sudden battery electric became the next major uh, train that was used. So it's funny how the business kind of sets the tone and that's followed by consumer demand three, four years later down the line. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the one thing you can't underestimate though is the impact of the BIK on the new vehicle driver. Okay, so if a company car drivers, they will go into an electric because it's such a taxable benefit. Whether it went too far with what the government did, that's open to opinion. But that was a key driver in people making the switch and gave it the gave it the fast foot forward for people to take engagement of that side of it. Then you also had the grant on top. The grant is then disappearing now, but that's that meant you had a big leverage of there. When we saw the size today of the fact of the differential between diesel and the um, BEV, it's still over twenty thousand pounds when you're buying a vehicle in a used marketplace what is going to be the support which is going to be there for those individuals in the used um, used market to go and buy a vehicle as their second vehicle potentially so within a family home if you've got one bev how many people prepare to have a second vehicle are you going to spend thirty thousand? no we need more choice and more vehicles at that twenty thousand and below bracket until until it gets that point similar to the hybrid you're not going to see this massive transition even with the high fuel prices because it it It's just not the amount of vehicles there and the price point is not right for people to engage it. At the same time, you're still going to have those um, people who want to avoid 
EVs because of infrastructure and the range anxiety and the derogation anxiety. If you look walk down your street, you'll still have plenty of people who will say, Bev, not for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's how we change those the mindset of those people to adopt it because the supply is going to hit the used car market um, on a rapid hockey stake curve because of where we've gone from of very small, very small numbers of vehicles in 2020 being put on BEV as opposed to this today. So it's going to be interesting to watch how that comes and how much that drives down the price of EVs to make it that affordable price point for people. It's an interesting point around the second vehicle being BEV because you look at even the early adopters who have their charging ports mounted on the outside of their house. Often that's only one charging, you yeah. know, plug. Yeah. And, you know, we obviously, wet the type of, you know, consumer that will get the used vehicle, it will generally be the second vehicle that, you know, the primary vehicle will be provided as a company car or, or however. Yeah. So that's a really interesting point, actually. That And but what I would say at the same time is we talk about battery range, right? So when you're talking range anxieties and you're talking people looking for the 300 to 400 range, well, actually, when you get into the second vehicle home, vehicle in the home, a 100-mile range are going to be perfect because how many of the second cars in the home are doing more than a 100-mile range? So that's why there is a home for these different vehicles as they come through and feed through. It's just going to take time, and you're looking 26, 27, before it actually starts stabilising. The market will find its own space in the place. You can't force a market, but you need to make sure the infrastructure is there to help make a difference. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's and I know there is significant uh, investment in infrastructure, but that's a, that's an absolute must because um, even if the appetite's there uh, and the infrastructure isn't, then it won't it won't go, will it? No, absolutely not. No. So one one area that with BEV that we've noticed, and Martin, something we did last year was split the BEV away from the you know the catch all alternative fuel vehicle, which is what we used to call that, just simply because it's such a different product, you know hybrids very much fall into the same segment as the fleet, you know, in terms of the mileage, the, you know, the price at the fetch, whereas BEV is just away in its own right. Is that something that we're seeing on the retail platforms as well from what you see, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you go back just 12 months, there were very, very few BEV vehicles available. So if you were to look on the platforms, you could have seen a differential for the same vehicle of up to about £15,000 mm-hmm. because no one knew what was there. So um, I, I use the example of standard deviation, right? So if you go back, when you've got lots of volume, you've got a very small very small deviation point. When you've got such a small volume there, you've got a massive deviation point. So until you've got real volume coming through, there's no point looking at it in isolation because the results won't mean anything. So it's as we go through this year, next year, and the year after, those, value, those values will become more consistent within what you're seeing and it'll become a more reliable tool. But now's the right time to be talking about them individually. But the next step you'll be then looking at, I suspect, will be what's the difference between a premium and a mainstream? And do they do they track at different speeds going through? Within the leasing company, we track differently a plug-in hybrid to a self-charging hybrid. So just because the behaviours are different because of what goes on you would have seen them in your auction houses in the past a plug-in hybrid still in the same wrapper in which it was delivered with probably less so these days but in the that in the past it was a standard practice wasn't it mm. yeah it was yeah and that was that was born out of that benefit in kind thing again wasn't it yeah. where people took it because it was um benefiting them from a tax perspective but actually in reality they just weren't using it um at all and then, like you say the leads were just left in the back from brand new and didn't plug it in however now that sort of plug-in again i think that's part of it, it's about education as well isn't it yeah. that how to use the vehicle properly now a lot of those plug plug-ins have seen uh, a massive increase in interest and in, and people buying them because again they've realized if they're using it as a second vehicle or whatever actually the amount of mileage albeit very small in relation to the overall mileage the car's doing uh nipping to the shops and everything else you can do quite a lot just on plug-in alone mm-hmm. and and it's it's amazing how people's mindset about plug-in has completely changed from almost oh well it just helps me from a business user to get the car cheaper in terms of or it's cheaper on my own pocket through to then actually the education of a consumer and if they use it properly how valuable it can be and save them a fortune in fuel costs yeah and and it also comes back to that point around when the first plug-in came around they were just an extension of what the nice vehicle was but now because it's a variation from a BEV vehicle 
we had the first ones and it was like the range should be 30 and you were seeing them and the rate, true range was 12 or 13. But these days, the range of 50 is a range of 50 yes. and they'll come through your auctions at a range of 50. Well, 50, as you say, again, there's a, there, there, there is a home for a range of 50 vehicles and will work for different people of that side of it. So, the, it, but that's very different again to when you just have a self-charging hybrid, which is doing a similar sort of job, but in a totally different way. Yeah. Martin, you spoke this morning about the, the cost per kilowatt hour, I think you said, mm. is part of your presentation. Yeah, well, we, we put all of our staff through some EV training, so I think that's the other big thing about uh, battery electric and hybrid to a degree. There's still a massive education process got to go on with retailers and consumers and everything else, and that needs to happen to help people get their questions answered. So I remember part of that training that we had... Um, said just when the Nissan Leaf, which is obviously one of the very first hybrids come out, um, and moving forward in terms of the amount of sort of batteries nowadays are, tend to be made of sort of 48 cells within a, a one larger battery. And um, the statistics were something, this is off the top of my head, so please, um, if that's slightly wrong, forgive me. But I, I think when back in 2009, it was something like it was costing uh, Nissan £1,200 uh, for that lithium battery that produced one kilowatt hour of power. And the cost, uh, bear in mind those Nissans, I think when they first came out, was something like a recorded 50-mile range, and it actually only did about 32, if you were lucky. Um, whereas speed forward to now, um, the cost for that one kilowatt hour is now £100 to the manufacturer. So it just shows you how the cost of that technology has gone in the space of 10 or 15 years. And I, I hope with more and more manufacturers uh, expanding the range uh, of their whole battery electric vehicle range, um, I mean, I think we're up to about something like 187 different models and derivatives, whereas less than four years ago that was about 38 yeah. or something of that nature. So that will create competition. It will hopefully drive some of the prices down so they become more affordable for people. Uh, yeah, and it's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch and see how that all evolves over time, really is. It's interesting that the, the battery technology seems to be following the, the Moore's Law trajectory, you know, like the, the cost of store data gets exponentially cheaper over time. It seems the cost of storing electricity and, you know, maybe not producing it just yet, we're not quite at nuclear fusion just yet, but, you know, being able to store energy is becoming cheaper all the time, which is just helping that, you know, that electric product no end. Yeah, you're going to be in a position where you have new startups, new ways of doing things, just because of the fact you produce a battery the way you do today. Well, we might produce a battery in a totally different way in a few years' time. So there are plenty of scientists out there working on stuff. There's a lot of more clever people than me who've got an idea on how this stuff is going to evolve and how it's going to work. Plenty of people have failed. Some people have succeed. Mm -hmm. So all of that competition in the future where it's going and on that part of it is only going to benefit the long-term long -term strategy of where we want to go. And it, it was an interesting point that we, I think somebody asked as part of the, the forum today was the whole point of battery degradation. You know, do you remember the early days yeah. you used to lease a battery in, in an electric car because it was perceived as being so unreliable, there's no point owning it. Whereas now, you know, the, the newest Teslas are saying something like at, at the end of its lifetime, they'll be 93% as effective as when it was new or something to that effect. Yeah. But we don't know, and that's the that's the answer at the minute, isn't it? We just don't know what the efficacy of these batteries is. That's it. There's there, there's going to be a lot of data, a lot of research. There's lots of information already out there. Um, someone brought up a really good point today, where they said, when you used to have a diesel car with a 300 brake horsepower, well, when you sold it, did you actually test it still had a 300 brake horsepower? Because who knows if it did? But so why are people getting hung up on what battery derogation is? A bit like what I was saying earlier. Even if that vehicle first off the rank was a 300-mile range, it will still have a home and a purpose for someone else, even if it's a 200 range. Mm -hmm. But the feedback and different talking to different people, 15 to 17% for a six-, seven-year-old battery seem to be working. But at the same time, there will be people out there working on how can they slot in a different cell, what can they change, is there a, how easy is it going to be to take a battery out? All of those things are being worked on in different avenues with it somewhere around this infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. And we're already seeing businesses that can remove those cells and replace them with new ones. To, so if you did have a battery that was um, degrading quicker than you'd expected it to, I think very quickly there'll be organisations available for to go and 
pop in like a quick fit and it will just, right, we're going to take two cells out while you wait and put two cells in. I'm sure that technology is there today, but will speed up and be re more readily available as time goes on. Just, oh yeah, I don't think it's a big issue. And you're right, Ben, you know, uh, there used to be lease batteries and that's completely changed. There's no such thing anymore. Um, purely to get over the worry of, well, nobody knows how long these batteries are going to last. And if it goes, well, you haven't got a car, have you? Because without the power, <laughs> you, you've just yeah. got metal with some wheels. Um, but I think that's great testimony when you think um, those early adopters all those years ago, those cars are still running around today. Yeah. Um, and fine, they might have had a, you know, a bit more battery degradation. But I think as time goes on, that's not even going to be an issue for people. No. I think the one thing is we know that the dealer network and everything else of the independence it's when are they going to invest and how much are they going to have to invest to be able to change their business model people say there's a lot less maintenance required on these vehicles so what's that mean from their models and where are they going to going to um, put their effort so it might even be their effort has to come post the warranty period and you change and come up with the ideas that you say of what are you going to do and how you're going to do it so just because we change the technology, we also have a big mindset change of what's going to happen and what the future of the vehicle, the, the role of the car vehicle is going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. That's an, yeah, that's a really interesting point around how these vehicles will be maintained as well. I mean, I, I read that a, a BEV vehicle, because of its regen braking, likely won't need pads replacing for 100,000 miles, <laughs> which is just you know incredible when you think about how often you have to replace them these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we see it. Um, of the fact of what is there to actually change well i haven't seen i haven't seen a clutch go yet i'm on ev <laughs> <laughs> no you're right yeah well uh, that takes us to the bottom of the podcast thank you uh jeff and martin for taking the time to talk to us today and thank you to you the listener for joining us if you want to buy or sell vehicles to Aston Barkley, just visit our website at www.astonbarkley.net. You can get in touch with me at podcast at astonbarkley.net. And if you want to follow us on LinkedIn, it's at Aston Barkley Group. I've been Ben Crawford. You've been listening to the Aston Barkley Podcast. See you next time. Mm -hmm.